So what is Tempe Accelerates? This is a wonderful opportunity to give the presenters and the various areas that are presenting your comments. That's really what this is all about. This is a constructive process to help uh, all the different areas of the city come together and help us all achieve our goals. Tempe Accelerates is a way to present our overarching goals and achievements to make Tempe a better place. So we will uh, be discussing the cardiac arrest survival rates um, and our council priority of being safe and secure. These measurable goals operationalize the five council priorities for our cities, such as safe and secure communities, quality of life, sustainable growth and development, financial stability and vitality, and strong community connections. So our performance measure is number 4.11 to achieve a tree canopy of 25 trees per acre on our as an average on our city properties. This is an opportunity for the community and Tempe employees to participate by offering ideas and solutions as well as asking questions about how to reach our targets. I'm going to talk about two performance measures that focus on energy. Uh, the first one is energy reduction. So this is a dashboard showing the Kiwanis Recreation Center after the solar carports were installed. And the pink area shows you all the energy consumption at the Kiwanis Rec Center. And the green bars show the solar panel, the solar energy production. The sessions consist of presentations from different departments and partners that show the goal's current measure as well as our target for the future. The departments also discuss the efforts and strategies we are making in order to achieve our desired performance. And so we have a very visionary goal, and that is to reduce fatal and serious injury crashes to zero. Um, so we're here to talk about feeling of safety in, uh, in parks, and the specific council uh, priority that looks at or is under is uh, safe and secure uh, communities. Join us for Tempe Accelerates, a series of data-driven collaborative strategy sessions to explore how these goals help the community and what we can do to reach our targets. All right, good afternoon and welcome once again to Tempe Accelerates. My name is Andrew Ching. I am the city manager for the city of Tempe and I'm very pleased uh, to present two uh, teams uh, speaking to two of our performance measures. Those are performance measure 3.21, veteran supportive community designation, and 3.32, patient advocate services. Uh, the presentations will be approximately 10 minutes each. We will invite you to suggest strategies in the Q&A feature of the Teams application, and we will have the presenters discuss after the presentation. You can find that feature in the upper right hand corner of your screen. A feedback survey will be available on our website. We will provide the link in the Q&A and would appreciate you filling that out. In addition, we will provide links to our performance measures dashboard so you can explore and join us in achieving positive outcomes for our community. Now, along the way, there may be some time delays or technical challenges as we go through the presentations and we appreciate your patience as we work through those. First up in our presentations this afternoon uh, is performance measure 3.21, veteran supportive community designation. We have as presenters, Teresa Mays, uh, Michelle Leposky, and Octavia Harris. And I will now turn it over to the presenting team. Good afternoon. My Good afternoon. My name is Teresa Mays, Administrative Assistant, City of Tempe Human Services. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Michelle Leposky, the Assistant Director of Outreach and Engagement for the Pat Tillman Veterans Center at Arizona State University. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Octavia Harris. I'm the Deputy Human Services Director and Staff Liaison for the Tempe Veterans Commission. So let's get started. So the Veterans Supportive Community Designation is a program of the Arizona Coalition for Military Families, or ACMF. ACMF is a public-private partnership focused on building Arizona's capacity to care for and support all service members, veterans, their families, and the community. The creation of the coalition was in direct response to the primary need identified by those who work with service members, veterans, and their families. This requires coordination and collaboration between many individuals and organizations throughout the state. The Arizona Coalition for Military Families was launched in August, on August 19, 2009. Next slide, please. This performance measure is categorized under Priority 3, 
quality of life, enhancing the quality of life for all Tempe residents and workers through investment in neighborhoods, parks, the arts, human services, and city amenities with an emphasis on equity and diversity. Next slide, please. This performance measure 3.21 seeks to support those who have served by engaging Tempe employers to achieve a veteran supportive designation greater than or equal to the average of Valley cities as awarded by the Arizona Coalition for Military Families. Our target is to have 30 employers designated as veteran supportive employers by 2023. We currently have 18. Next slide, please. Public and private sector employers of all sizes are invited to be a part of the roadmap of Arizona veteran supportive employers, which will focus on engaging organizations as Arizona veteran supportive employers and strengthening recruiting, hiring and retention of service members, veterans and family members. The Arizona Coalition for Military Families offers virtually two hours of veteran supportive employer training and an hour and a half of military and veteran resource navigator training. The city of Tempe earned the veteran supportive designation in 2015. Tempe was the first city to achieve this. Next slide, please. Tempe is, a veteran, is both a veteran supportive employer and veteran supportive city. This means that Tempe is committed to developing and promoting benchmarks to assist the Arizona Coalition for Military Families in its pursuit to support veterans and their families through employment. Teresa will now talk about implementation. Next slide, please. The city of Tempe adheres to federal and state veterans preference points law in the recruitment and selection process. Vacancy announcements and mailers are sent to the U.S. Military Pipeline Veterans website, U.S. Vets Incorporated, Luke Air Force Job Resource Center, and the DES Arizona Veteran Employment Program. Human Resources is currently looking into new ways to track new hires who have served in active duty in the armed forces. And now, Michelle Leposky will speak about the Pat Tillman's Veterans Center. Thank you, Teresa. So at Arizona State University, there's over 21,000 employees as faculty and staff. And with that, there's just over two, um, between two to 300 of those staff members who are veterans, and they represent both the faculty and staff members. Uh, and at the Pat Tillman Veterans Center, we are servicing over 10,000 students who are military affiliated. So being a veteran supportive employer is, is very vital and important to ASU's charter of being inclusive, uh, recognizing that there is the support at the city of Tempe and, and knowing that our veteran employees are also supported is very reflective of how we are with our student veteran population. Uh, understanding the needs of not just the, the student themselves, but knowing what their family needs is also very, it's part of our efforts and what we do. And with our employees also at ASU, knowing that their veteran status is very important and what the support looks like uh, is, is, is one of the critical things that ASU does for our employees. So um, partnerships, partnership with the city of Tempe is very important for ASU. Uh, we are a very large, very large presence at uh, in Tempe and knowing that we have the support is uh, is is vital to our success and uh, really we thank the city of Tempe for always supporting us in our efforts and welcoming the veterans who do live in the city of Tempe and especially for our students. Next slide. And finally, Tempe provides support for veterans and military families through a number of programs and services. The Tempe Veterans Commission is also very supportive of this measure. The composition of the Tempe Veterans Commission allows for 11 members appointed for terms of three years each. And each commissioner represents an existing United States military and veteran service area, with one of the commission seats reserved for the Arizona Coalition for Military Families. The commission's charter assists in creating supporting community connection points to inform, guide, and direct military veterans seeking personal and professional enhancement services that includes education, mentoring, health, and wellness, along with workforce support, which is what this performance measure is all about. The commission relies on partnerships to encourage 
the increase in the veteran supportive employer designations. The Commission's creation of annual goals and encouragement of employers in obtaining this designation is an appropriate goal for the Commission. And at this time, we would appreciate any ideas you have to help accelerate this performance measure. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Wydell Holmes. I'll moderate our discussion here. I'm with the Office of Strategic Management and Diversity. And as a reminder, we do invite you to suggest strategies in the Q&A chat feature in the Teams application. And you can find that in the top right corner of your screen. Um, we'll also combine some similar themed questions if we don't have enough time for all of them, but I'll try to be as diverse as possible in the questions. We also invite you to send your suggestions directly to the presenters using the email address that you have on the screen now. So um, again, thank you to Octavia and Teresa and Michelle for their presentation. So our first question is, what are some of the businesses, um, who are some of the businesses who are currently designated as veteran supportive employers? Um, so of the 18 employers with that designation, um, there is of course the city of Tempe, as we previously stated, the Centers for Habilitation, Northern Trust, ADP, and Stanley Security. Great. So what's the first thing a business would need to do to become a veteran supportive business to earn that designation like the um, organizations that you mentioned? That's a fantastic question. I'm gonna love that to Octavia. <laughs> yes, absolutely, I can handle that one. So a business would actually, uh, would actually contact a CMF or the Arizona Coalition for Military Families and there they would talk with a roadmap navigator and that roadmap navigator would let them know when the next training date is and how they can actually register for that. And once okay. they complete that training, then uh, ACMF will provide them with um, a, a decal that they can place at their business and also add them to the list of uh, veteran supportive employers, uh, which they do have some of them on their website, but not all of them. Thank you, Octavia. And with the city having the designation as a veteran supportive organization, what are the programs and services that support our veterans that the city specifically offers? Great question. So uh, there's a few different programs, one of which is really comprehensive and really wraps services around the veteran, and that's through the Human Services Care 7 uh, work group. And there's specialized veterans navigators who provide case management, and that includes everything from actually getting veterans in touch with um, the Department of Veteran Affairs and ensuring that they understand um, and can receive assistance with applying for any benefits they may be eligible for. Tempe also has a really great veterans court that ensures that um, there are people that understand the situation that a veteran has um, having served our country. And um, our, our CARE 7 case managers do attend the veterans courts and ensure that if they're not aware of a veteran that may need assistance to ensure that they are achieving their best quality of life in Tempe, then they're there to be able to meet them and offer those services. Additionally, um, Tempe Fire, which is actually presenting today, they have a patient assistance service that also provides services to veterans, as well as anyone in the community that may need those services. So that's just a few examples of some of those services. Okay. So a similar question, and I think this one will pass over to Michelle, is what are the services available to veteran students since we are a town and gown uh, community, as we like to call it? That's a great question. So we really do take on a very proactive um, approach with our students, very holistic, making sure whatever their needs may be. We have an advocacy team, which is very unique in higher education. And in that advocacy team, it's more of this very high touch concierge slash life coach in really helping our students to not only transition into going to the university, but getting them integrated, helping them understand what it's like to be at the university and that they do belong at the university, and then also taking it to the next level and making sure that their family is as well, um, making sure that their benefits are being processed smoothly, and however we can help them, it's all about their well-being. And so we, during this COVID, during the pandemic, we have really taken full effort in making sure that our students don't feel that they're on their own. We created different um, Zoom uh, events 
throughout the entire time of this past academic year, uh, making sure that they, they know they are supported uh, at all times. We gave, we did phone campaigns, we sent out emails, and so however we can help uh, our student veteran population, we we really went above and beyond so they knew that they weren't alone in all of this. Great, thank you, Michelle. Um, you mentioned earlier the businesses that have this community designation and the target that you have in place for, I think it was 30 um, businesses to have this designation, which would include both ASU and Tempe. So what are the next steps for implementation? What are the next strategies to really move that target and achieve that? So since the Veterans Commission does have um, and annual goals that they do set. What they're really working to do is get in touch with all the veterans that are within the community of Tempe. And they're doing so through um, e-blasts that were actually just launched formally and are, are sent out quarterly as of November 2020. And that and there's information that's in there that would be of interest to veteran and military families. Um, additionally, the the commission will be looking at other strategies to expand this performance measurement to ensure that we are building strong relationships and strong partnerships to ensure we can reach the, the business community as much as possible, including really working much more closely with the Tempe Chamber, which actually has a military affairs committee as well. Great. Well, thank you. That looks like all the questions we have in regards to our veterans community designation. Um, I want to remind the audience that um, we do have links to the dashboard and please continue to offer your questions in the Q&A feature. Um, we also would love your feedback on this particular presentation as well as the next one in a few moments. And so we have that link as well in the uh, comment section to uh, complete the survey. Um, we've also provided links for our performance measures so you can visit the entire dashboard and see over 104 uh, performance measures that align to five council priorities creating wonderful outcomes for our community. And so um, if you continue to have any questions, we'll loop back to this group um, if we have any questions to follow up on. So with that, I'll send it over to Andrew, our city manager. Thank you. OK, thank you, Rydell, and thank you to Octavia, Teresa, and Michelle for a great presentation. Uh, next presentation we have is on uh, performance measure 3.232, excuse me, 3.32, patient advocate services. And our presenters today will be Nick Ells and Dana Cardenas. Go ahead and take it away. Good afternoon. This is Dana Cardenas. I'm the EMS and Community Coordinator and Registered Nurse for Tempe Fire and Medical Rescue. Good afternoon, and I'm Nick Ells. I'm a Deputy Chief for Tempe Fire and Medical Rescue in the Medical Services section. So let's get started. Uh, today's uh, today's presentation is going to be on uh, quality of life uh, council priority 3.32 for Tempe Fire Medical Rescue Department's patient advocate services. The Tempe Fire Medical Rescue Department is an all hazards department that responds to all different types of calls for service. The patient advocate services addresses medical conditions, quality of life issues for members of our community before they actually become an emergency. Past visits Tempe residents and veterans in their homes on a scheduled as needed basis to assess their medical needs, develop a, a plan of care, and follow up schedule that allows for them to receive care in the comfort of their own homes. The service improves the health and well being of our residents, it reduces the number of calls to the emergency 911 system, and increases the availability of Tempe Fire Medical Rescue Department companies for other calls of service. Next slide. So as I just stated, Tempe Fire Medical Rescue Department is an all hazards department. Um, this places that places the safety and health and well-being of our community members in the highest of regards. On our medical calls for service, we accomplish this by advocating for our patients. But for you to fully understand how we got to this point, I believe it's important for you to understand the history of Tempe Fire Medical Rescue and how we've evolved since its inception. So we look in January of 1903, City Council ordered the creation of Tempe Fire Department after a large fire destroyed several buildings, including the Burchett Grocery Store on the east side of Mill Avenue between 4th and 5th Streets. In 1961, City Council agrees to convert the Tempe Fire Department to a professional fire department following a house fire that tragically kills 
four small children in their sleep. This is the deadliest fire to Tempe in Tempe's history to date. Uh, when we look forward to January of 1977, the fire service nationwide was evolving and they had a need to for the ability to deliver advanced medical uh, life support to our community in a rapid fashion and that need had been identified. The need was fulfilled by the city of Tempe by our fire department being one of the first to send firefighters to paramedic school and now having the ability to deliver advanced life-saving measures to our community members suffering from a myriad of medical emergencies. And when we fast forward till January of 2014, under the direction of Fire Chief Greg Reese, Tempe Fire Medical Res the Tempe Fire Department undergoes a name change, as you will, um, a rebranding from the Tempe Fire Department to Tempe Fire Medical Rescue Department. Our organization's ability to perform all types of rescues and approximately 80% of our calls for service being medical in nature, this name change was more indicative of who we are and the services that we provide to the community. In January of 2015, we identified the need to develop a program for our community members that don't necessarily have an emergency at the time, but it has the potential to develop into a medical emergency if the patient's medical or cognitive needs aren't addressed. A program that will essentially improve the quality of life, health, and well-being of our vulnerable population in our community by advocating, educating, and coordinating care for those in need. With these goals in mind, Tempe Fire Medical Rescue developed an extremely innovative program, a first of its kind in the form of a community health program that we now call Patient Advocate Services. So in 2017, uh, the City of Tempe and uh, the Fire Medical Rescue Department always looking to, um, for more ways to better our service delivery and overall patient care, decided our fire department members can deliver service better than most private ambulance companies. Our membership values and the professionalism far exceed that of what the industry standards are in, in uh, private industry. We were then awarded a certificate of necessity to provide our own ambulance transport within the city of Tempe. And that effectively, uh, and we effectively delivered a higher level of service and advocacy for our community. Now, if we fast forward to present day, uh, we look at where we, where we were last year, a global pandemic had just been declared. Um, we have a stay at home order that had just been issued and people um, are asked to stay at home in quarantine in order to slow the infection rate of COVID-19. People who are elderly, have multiple comorbidities or medical problems um, are identified as the most uh, vulnerable and susceptible to the disease. Uh, cities around the country are, uh, were scrambling to figure out um, a way that they can identify those vulnerable populations, get services such as medical attention, food and education on uh, on the disease and where to get tested. When it comes to Tempe, patient advocate services had already had a detailed list of who fits those population types. With our partnerships within the city, county, state, we we're able to effectively deliver that medical attention from their homes in the form of telemedicine, help refill much needed prescription medications for them, deliver food boxes while they're unable to leave their home, provide masks, gloves, hand sanitizer, and education to those community members with how they can best protect themselves from the coronavirus and the locations in which testing was available. The global pandemic has actually pushed the idea of community medicine programs such as PASS to the center stage nationally in order to provide care and services to those vulnerable populations. Um, and, we, and, and in fact, improves the quality of life and helps those who are in need. Um, our patient advocate services program is so innovative, in fact, that we're looking at it, we are looked at as being the national standard for community medicine right now. Um, currently, we're working with U of A also, who is uh, who's looking to write curriculum based on um, our past program for community medicine. Next slide. Thank you, Chief Ells. Patient Advocate Services really does improve the overall quality of life by providing wraparound services for all of our um, Tempe residents. This stabilizes their lives and really helps to keep them out of the hospitals. It really helps um, those that are most vulnerable in our community. We want to make sure that we address but are not limited to those experiencing homelessness, veterans and our seniors. Next slide. Quality of life. This could be difficult to measure, but we can drastically improve the quality of life of our residents and it's seen by the good quality outcomes that we do have. 
one of the things that we want to make sure to do is to impact the quality of life of patients, but also in the bigger picture, looking at the 911 call reduction and non-emergent calls is really kind of how this really got started. Wanting to make sure that we address the needs of patients before a 911 call actually does get kicked out. Increasing responsibility for our crews is really important. I know if it was my family and I had a true emergency, I would want to make sure that the crews that were responding to that would be there available within a good amount of time and be ready for that call. Um, the Tempe Fire and Medical Rescue Team really does address the overall needs of all of the patients. This gives a lot more time for them to be able to have with the patients one on one and gives a more holistic and multidisciplinary approach. Next slide please. So why does this matter? This really does matter because yes, it does improve the overall quality of life for our Tempe residents. It empowers them to be able to take a hold of and empower them to be a participant in their plan of care, but it also helps to increase the response times of our crews. And during the pandemic, we really did see that we were able to do a large, broad outreach. Um, we were able to implement things, as Chief L said, with um, param, uh, with telemedicine, and we were able to do a lot more community outreach preventatively to be able to help those so that they could quarantine. We had a little over probably 45 to 50 um, recurrent patients that we were seeing, but when we were asked to identify those most vulnerable in our community, we reached out to a little over four to 450 of our previous past patients. Not to mention that we engaged with senior trailer parks, group homes, subsidized housing for those who were disabled and those experiencing homelessness. This was a little over 2,500 people that we were able to make contact with within our community. The multi-departmental uh, collaborative that we were able to have with our city of Tempe, like our HOPE team, Tempe PD, Parks and Recs, um, CARE 7, and also CBI, we were able to um, house the most medically vulnerable in our community and provide food, shelter, medical, and behavioral health care services. Next slide, please. One of the biggest privileges that I have still today and I can say is, is, is the biggest thing for me every day when I go home is knowing that we've impacted somebody, even if it's just one person. And we had a couple that uh, was an elderly couple that did not have any children or any family in the country. And one had cognitive issues, one had physical limitations well into their 90s. They had lived in the city of Tempe for over 45 years but just recently in 2020 had begun to have additional issues. If you see the number of calls that we had for service, not only EMS, but PD um, and just the fall risk alone, we were able to implement things and come into um, this couple's life and be able to provide them with transitional care placement. And now they are happy and together, which is really what our overall goal was. Next slide, please. All right, so when we look at this graph right here, this is a more of a comparison of patient enrollment versus patient outreach. Um, the yellow, it, it's, it represents, um, I would say patients or, or, or people that we we're able to mitigate their issues by uh, one or two contacts with care coordination. Um, these are people that, that we're able to, to take care of right away, whereas the blue, the blue represents those that are chronically ill and uh, long term management is needed. Next slide, please. So the total past patient 911 calls. When we look at this, uh, our performance measures to achieve a 50% reduction in 911 calls from patients uh, enrolled in patient advocate services program. And this is all the calls that we've had since uh, 2017 um, for 911. We had uh, 671 uh, calls for service of 911 calls beforehand and now when we look at it um, you know we're, we're at 402 so with uh, 246 patients enrolled since 2017 we've had a 40 percent reduction in 911 calls and I understand that our we still have not met our actual performance measure but we are still working hard towards it next slide 
When we get a 911 call, we do not have the choice of who we want to see. We serve our community equally and we are able to help everyone out there. Um, we strive to help have a more holistic approach and a more patient centric approach to care by by having availability to health care, vaccines, medications. We're able to provide with our community resources, essential food and cleaning supplies. We make sure that we have um, direct connections through our human services and connections for housing and connecting those that are isolated. Pre or post pandemic, we have always made those connections for our residents. So just because the pandemic hit, we really saw a highlight on what isolation looks like. But in truth, some of our patients that we currently have have been experiencing this for a very long time, and we've been connecting them long before the pandemic hit with telemedicine and ways to stay connected. Next slide. So strategies. Um, here at Tempe Fire, we are actually really proud of our predictability model, and this really kind of is an all encompassing um, approach. And what we do is we take um, the data from our EMS calls. We look at the number of 911 calls that somebody may have, which is the highest risk factor. Um, we encompass this with multiple medications, medical diagnoses, and also if a person happens to live alone and is a high fall risk, those are all predictability things that go into play whenever we do our outreach uh, to our patient populations. The other thing that we really heavily do is education out in our community, and we um, provide education in our schools um, to our youth through RX, our, like our RX360 um, opioid prevention program, um, like our, our CCR continuous compression uh, model, and we also do this in the middle school and then in the high schools. We also are um, doing outreach to our community every single day by encouraging um, people to become part of their medical care. Another strategy that we have is finances, uh, our financial strategy, really to be able to keep um, this program in, in service. We want to make sure that we have um, some stability to be able to keep this program afloat. And in doing that, we have um, become uh, contracted with our state um, health care plan access and also with our Veterans Administration to help to secure some stability for um, to be able to continue our, the work that we do here with PAS. Next slide, please. So when we look at the PAS program, uh, we're faced with some challenges. Uh, one of those challenges is uh, staffing for the increase of demand of service. When we looked at our chart for uh, the patients that we have enrolled versus patient contact, um, if you noticed it from 2017 uh, to 2020, we've more than doubled the amount of, of contacts and patients that we have. This is a huge challenge for us just because um, that staffing uh, we need to improve that staffing in order for us to be able to, to meet those demands of, of our people and, uh, and our community members. Uh, another, another challenge that we have is the ability to connect with the homeless, po the homeless population. Um, it becomes very challenging when we don't have um, a permanent address or they don't have cell phones. But one of the things that we are doing right now is we're participating in what's um, what's known as HMIS, which is the Homeless Management Information System. We're actually the first fire department to, to utilize and become uh, members of the system. Um, what it does is it helps us uh, with um, work with social workers, behavioral health teams, keep track of resource, uh, resources provided uh, through social services and uh, last known contact data. So with that, we can address, try and identify where someone's experiencing homelessness, where they might be staying. Um, uh, people, other people that are using HMS, uh, we have people, uh, we're part of the homeless task force. We have, uh, uh, we're working in coordination with HOPE, CARE 7, HUD, a multitude of different agencies um, within, within our, own, our own city to help meet these challenges. But even with that system in place, um, it's still challenging to try and find um, where the patient, where, where that population might be staying at. And the third one is financial. 
just like any channel, any uh, program, it takes money to run. Right now, it is a grant funded program, and uh, you know, once once grant funds go away or once they dry up, um, if we cannot meet that that cost need, the program is also going away. Like Dana talked about uh, before, we had um, we we've, we've done some 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 very innovative things like secure contracts with uh, access and other medical providers. Um, with the VA to help offset some of those costs um, as well. And, and that's something that we're continuing to, to pursue as, as well as grants. But that financial impact has a definite, uh, or that, that financial challenge has a definite uh, impact on our ability to staff um, for to meeting for the increased demands of service. And uh, with that, next slide, please. Uh, with that, we'd love to hear any of your ideas for uh, for the Patient Advocate Services Program. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nick, and thank you, Dana. Um, again, Wydell Holmes with the Strategic Management and Diversity Office. I do have a few questions that I'd like to ask the group um, that have come in, but I do also want to remind everybody that we'd love your suggestions on strategies. Please include those in the Q&A feature of the Teams app. You can find that in the right top hand corner of your screen. And then we um, also remind you to um, complete the post uh, acceleration survey, which will drop into the chat. So you mentioned Nick and Dana that um, in the last few years you've doubled patient contact. So what can you be part of the patient advocate services um, program if you've never called 911? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know we don't we don't just take patients that have called 911. We take uh, patients that are referred to us from hospitals, um, from other uh, interdepartment agencies, uh, other agencies through the state, through the county. Um, if they're identified and they're referred to us, and it's and it's uh, something that we can help with, then absolutely, um, you know, we we do a determinants of uh, social determinants of health. We we give that that assessment. We look at them and we find out what's the best way that we can get services. Um, to these people. Uh, thank you. We dropped that information in regards to um, our web page on patient advocate services in the chat. Um, next question in regards to strategies. Do you have greater results in using telemedicine as a strategy in reducing 911 calls? Thank you for that question. And yes, um, so long before I said um, the pandemic hit, we were already using telemedicine. So we've been using telemedicine for about six to seven years now um, to meet the needs of not just our veteran population with our tele telemed program, but also um, with our private practice uh, physicians that are local here. So yes, we are able to meet quite a few needs and there are a few programs out there right now um, that we're able to actually connect all of our city residents. Um, if they do not have that access, they can contact us. Okay. You mentioned um, working with uh, medical healthcare professionals, um, say somebody's you know, primary doctor. Do you, what strategies do you have in regards to enrolling their patients into the PAS program? Well, doctors often call us and really the first step in doing anything with the patient is doing it the, in, during the intake process is finding out who their primary care provider is. If they do not have one um, currently, then we look at who their healthcare plan is and who is a network for them and make those contacts. But yes, we coordinate primarily. That is our goal is to connect them with their primary care physician for the plan of care, especially if they've just uh, been discharged from the hospital or have just had a surgery. We make sure that the care coordination with the primary care is, is key. Great. You mentioned your predictive model in regards to um, kind of the the ideal uh, patient to enroll in PAS. Can you talk a little bit more about your strategies on how you connect that data to um, actually reducing the 911 calls? Absolutely. So what we did is we took all of the overall 911 calls, even if it's even if it's just one 911 call. Um, but then we also um, overlay the multiple medications that a patient might be taking, that's another risk. Um, multiple medical diagnoses, uh, number of um, falls or fall risk that they may have if they just had a knee or a hip replacement. If the patient lives alone or if they have a known identified cognitive issue, 
those are all huge risk factors. Um, then coupled with all of that together, we're able to kind of put together this predictability model and we do preventative outreach to those um, patient populations. So before when we were waiting for a referral maybe um, from a crew or from PD, now we're actually taking a proactive approach to things and calling people long before they have multiple Great, thank you for that explanation of how to connect really good data with strategies. Uh, question in regards to vaccinations, COVID vaccinations. Do you have strategies in place for vaccinating um, your participants in the program? Actually, we we have, and, and we just got, uh, we just finished a, a vaccination program. So like I talked about earlier, we have uh, some wonderful partnerships, whether it's it's through inner city uh, departments, it's through the county or through the state. And uh, we've we've had outreach with them, um, organizations like TCAA, um, Senior Adult Independent Living, and we've had these developed relationships where they've also identified those um, those patients that live in Tempe that are unable to get vaccinated because they've had uh, they don't have the technology such as email or internet um, or the ability to get to one of those those vaccination sites. And so we've actually partnered with them to hold a vaccination clinic last week um, to get those people vaccinated in coordinating their transportation uh, to the sites, getting them vaccinated um, and, and providing that medical care after vaccination. Um, and absolutely, it has been uh, an extremely successful program that, that we've done, or, or I should say partnership that we've had with them. Okay. So our next question is you, you in Tempe Fire Medical Rescue responds to other uh, valleys here in the city um, because we're, we take our regional approach to public safety. Do other cities have a PAS program? Because I would think that the 911 calls are part of this data set that are also, you know, not, not necessarily a burden on the system, but require resources from the emergency system? Um, well, yes, we do, we do respond regionally. Um, like I talked about earlier, this, is, this was really an innovative thing that we've done here in the city of Tempe. There's been a couple other departments regionally that have attempted to, uh, to put a similar type of program in. Um, and they had great success with it. But like I talked about my challenges, funding and the, the financial challenge of it, um, and of the sustainability of the program really becomes an issue. Um, and a lot of the department, a couple of the departments that had programs that were similar to ours, but not the same, they've had to back off um, because they didn't, they did not have the funding and uh, uh, stability to, to continue those. And so right now that's it, it which kind of leads me into the community medicine when the pandemic hit and this really put community medicine or community health care programs, you know, into the forefront. And this is something that everybody uh, nationwide is looking at. We are actually getting calls from not only places regionally here or state, we're, we're we've been talking to places all over the country that want to start or develop a community medicine program because of the success that we've had here in Tempe. You mentioned that earlier in regards to U of A is standardizing the Tempe model um, as the, uh, you know, the, the gold standard for a um, tele or for the patient advocate services program. What are the key strategies that you utilize to really get this off the ground even prior to the pandemic? So some of the key strategies in developing PAS is um, really developing community resources. Number one key, um, making sure that you're well connected with your community is, is, is priority number one. Developing a multi-departmental approach to channel, challenging populations. Um, the city of Tempe, we are fortunate um, here in the city of Tempe because all of our departments work so well and collaborate so well together. So I think that we're in a unique position um, unlike some other cities that we really um, do have a multi-departmental approach. The other thing is um, our electronic health charting is really a broad holistic assessment with data reporting capabilities. Uh, this has been so important as, as you've seen, we've been able to you know, give some really great data back um, to 2017 and 2016. 
Um, and then the other big thing is to have strong goals and policies in place at the foundation. Um, you want to make sure that as you start working with other departments and other collaborations with other people out in the community that you have clear workflows established and care coordination models that, that you have in place. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Nick and Dana. This is um, the questions that we have in the chat as well as some of the questions that have come in. Um, I do have a follow up question for our veterans designation group, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. And we did have a question come in that I didn't catch um, previously, so I do want to give an opportunity for um, our team to address the question, and I really appreciate that it was asked in the chat. Are we reaching out in regards to veterans community designation? Are we reaching out to our neighbor neighboring native nations to let them know of the services that the city of Tempe has available? Could you speak a little bit to those strategies and programs? So I would have to look a little more deeply into that, but CARE 7 um, as well as the HOPE team and I'm sure um, some of our other departments within the city, they are definitely reaching out to them to make them aware of the services that are available. But in terms of this strategy, that is not something that we've approached for the veteran supportive employer designation, but it is absolutely one that we'll add um, to help accelerate this. Great. Well, thank you, Octavia. And with that, I'm just going to remind everybody to uh, complete the feedback survey. We'd love to hear from you. And if you have any other strategies, please feel free to contact those on the screen. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Andrew Ching. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Rydell. Thank you to, uh, to Nick and to Dana for a really great presentation and to all of our presenters today. I hope those of you who are watching for the first time or have even watched on multiple occasions have a better understanding of why we do what we do. We're really focused in on trying to to work with our uh, teams that are committed to these uh, to the uh, the achievement of the goals set in these performance measures because they roll up to our council priorities that are intended to make this a better community for all of us to to live, work and play in and for those of us who work for the city of Tempe to better tune in our services to what the priorities are and make sure that we're delivering exactly what we need to on a daily consistent basis. And I think you heard from two really strong teams and the work that they're doing and and we uh, we support them and we appreciate your input. Uh, our next uh, session will be on June 24th, 2021, uh, same time, and it will be regarding performance measure 3.12 Municipal Equality Index, and 3.13, Disability Social Inclusion. Please join us for other future sessions. Uh, as you can see uh, up on the screen, we have uh, we have more to come. And as always, you can join us on uh, at the website, uh, tempe.gov slash Tempe Accelerates for a lot more details. Thank you again to the presenters. Thank you to Megan Hutchison and to Idell Holmes from our Strategic Management and Diversity Area for all the work they do to make this happen every one of these sessions and appreciate your attention to these and we will see you again on June 24th. Thank you.